Good morning, everybody, or afternoon. Um, I think this is how I'd like to be introduced before every class. Just come out from behind the curtain. And we're going to be working on a smoke machine for the future, so we'll work it we'll work that out. Um, thank you for coming. We're happy to do this. Today for Supreme Court Nerds is the first Monday in October, which means this year's term begins. And so this year is going to be a particularly interesting year, and we would like to Oops, I would like to push the button correctly. So here's what we're going to do. We'll just do a little bit of basic Supreme Court stuff, to give you a feel for what the court does. Uh, we're going to review the past term, but that's like saying we're going to talk about Justice Scalia, because that really was the big event. And we're going to talk a little about this upcoming term, but that's also like saying we're going to talk about Justice Scalia, because his absence on the court cast a huge shadow on its future and has a very important role to play in this year's presidential election. And then we hope that we'll leave enough time for some questions. So just a real basic primer, the Supreme Court has two functions. One function is to interpret federal statutes and the other is to what I call police constitutional boundaries. That is to declare what the law is in reference to the Constitution. Now, most of the really, I guess you would say, controversial cases come from that latter function. But the court still plays a very important role in interpreting federal statutes, and sometimes those interpretations also have significant effects on the population. The court has one term per year runs from the first Monday in October till sometime near the end of June when they run out of things to do. Um, typically that's the last week in June and that's when the blockbuster cases often come out. So all appeals to the court are discretionary. That is, the court doesn't have to take any appeals at all. And those appeals can come from state courts if there's a federal issue involved, or from federal courts, again, because federal courts have certain jurisdiction over federal kinds of cases. It takes four justices to agree to hear a case. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean those justices are all going to vote one way or another, but if four of the nine justices say, let's hear this decision, they hear that. The court takes a recess beginning sometime near the end of June, and they reconvene officially today, but actually they were back to work last week, and on Friday they held what's called the long conference, where they catch up on their backlog. And so you get a feel for what the court might be doing based on those initial grants to hear cases. Um, this year they granted certiari, which is the decision to hear a case, to eight decisions out of their long conference. That's five fewer than last year. And then this morning they denied a couple others, another eight. So you can see that they don't take a lot of cases. In fact, they only take about one percent of the cases that are presented to them for appeal. And that works out to, as it did last year, about 76, 77 cases. But if you exclude the cases that are called summary dispositions, where for one reason or another they thought they made a mistake or everybody agrees and they send it back to the lower court, they only decided 63 cases. Now, about 30 years ago they decided twice as many cases. So either um, the cases are getting more difficult or they like their gig and they're doing less work. It's hard to tell. So not many decisions get there. And just yesterday, um, Justice Ginsburg in the New York Times said, the fact that we don't take many cases and the ones we do take involve some conflict, either the courts can't agree or there's some big conflict among the branches, means that we take the hardest cases so it shouldn't surprise people that there's a lot of disagreement about their outcome. If they took easy cases, there wouldn't be much purpose to them. So last term, for example, 
they agreed unanimously in about 29% of the cases they decided, and they had some form of unanimity in about 40% of the cases. In other words, sometimes they can all agree on the outcome, but they disagree on the reasoning to get there. So less than half of the time, they're actually in some kind of unanimous agreement, which makes sense if they're deciding really difficult cases. So if you're interested, here's some good sources of information. Um, you can go to the Cornell Legal Information Institute or the SCOTUS blog, which is really probably your one stop you'd ever want to go to for anything about the Supreme Court, um, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg jokes. So you probably want to check that place out. So let's begin then. And quite clearly, the year's most suspenseful mystery is this. Will Merrick Garland be confirmed, or which presidential candidate will fill future vacancies? And this goes back to Antonin Scalia. He dies unexpectedly in February. Um, the court had been split, leaning in a conservative direction with five votes. Without him on the court, that equates to a conventional understanding of a four to four split between liberals and conservatives. President Obama nominated Merrick Garland, but the Senate has not acted on that nomination yet. It seems unlikely that they will. And so this election day will be the first time since 1864 when there will be a vacancy on the Supreme Court that the Senate has not moved to fill. So what's the Scalia effect? Well, I want to go back a minute. <laughs> OK, so can we go back a minute? I want to go back to talking just a moment about Merrick Garland and uh, the failed attempt to uh, appoint a Supreme Court justice during President Obama's term. Because this is real timely in, with our election pending. Um, we have this one pivotal appointment that, depending on who's the president, we will either have a, a President Clinton appointee, yet again, or a President Trump appointee. Um, and uh, I wanted to note a couple of things about this. For one thing, uh, we already know what a President Trump appointee would look like. Um, he's trotted out 11 potential Supreme Court justices, nominees, um, should he become president. Uh, so we would, we would get us, we, we have a pretty good sense of who would be replacing a ju Justice Scalia if Trump becomes president. Um, all of these, uh, well, the vast majority of his potential appointees um, have been signed off by the Heritage Foundation. They're on the Heritage Foundation's list of, hey, we like these guys for Supreme Court. Um, and if you don't, are unfamiliar with the Heritage Foundation, it's a think tank for con what is considered conservative values. Um, so you're going to get a rather very conservative justice if Trump does abide by his promises as a candidate to appoint one of these 11 people. Clinton has played it much closer to the vest. Uh, but we, she has not said anything about who she would appoint to the United States Supreme Court. However, that has not stopped pundits from opining, well, who would be likely Clinton appointees? And for the most part, the folks' names that have been bandied around are folks that uh, President Obama has already vetted, uh, which makes a lot of sense. These are people who have already gone through somewhat of a background check. Um, they look like acceptable nominees. And those are the folks that we are hearing uh, from in the background, although we haven't heard anything from the candidate herself. These nominees are fairly moderate, very consistent with what we've seen from President Obama's administration. Um, people who have obviously liberal or progressive leanings, but are not radical in any sense of the word. Uh, they're also remarkably diverse. So among the pool that's being bandied about um, are several African-American candidates, uh, someone of Vietnamese descent, someone of Korean descent, someone of East Indian descent. Um, so we may finally get our first Asian Supreme Court justice if we have a President Clinton nominated, which we haven't had before. Um, um, so to get, just to give you a sense of where you're, what, what may have an impact on who you vote for, uh, we get a very different appointee depending on um, whether we have a, a President Trump or a President Clinton. But it doesn't stop there um, because we have the three Supreme, sitting Supreme Court justices who are near retirement, if not at retirement age. Uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is 83. Justice uh, 
Breyer is 78, I think, and Justice Kennedy is 80. Two of these justices, Breyer and Ginsburg, are part of the progressive part of the court, and Kennedy occasionally swings in a progressive uh, direction. So we have three potential new justices that may be appointed by the next president in addition to filling Justice Scalia's seat. So this election should be about the court in part. Mm -hmm. So what effect would Justice Scalia's, or did his absence have? Um, not as much as people thought, directly, a lot of indirect effect. There are two cases where most likely his vote would have made a difference. Uh, one was the case involving the, the legality of President Obama's deferred action program, and the other was a case involving uh, whether or not state employees who weren't members of a union, a state employees union, could be asked to pay were, what were called agency fees. In that latter case, it was pretty clear that it was teed up to say that it's unconstitutional to require state employees to pay those agency fees. As it turned out, there was a four to four vote tie on, this, on the United States Supreme Court, which meant that the lower court's ruling stayed in place, which had upheld those agency fees. So that's one where the, his vote clearly would have made a difference because there's no doubt where he would have voted. And I'm going to pick up on the first case, uh, the deferred action case. Uh, this is a case that was about President Obama's, and I'll, I'm going to quote here, Deferred Action for Parents of Americans and Lawful Permanent Residence Program, or better known as DAPA. Uh, this was a program that permitted the relatives of U.S. citizens who were undocumented to not be de deported. So let's say you, uh, we have, for the most part, it was children who had been born in the U.S. and were U.S. citizens, and their parents were undocumented. This program, an executive program instituted by the president, stop their deportation. Um, again, this is a case that was a four to four split. In this case, uh, it left in place the lower court's decision to actually enjoin the program, finding it unconstitutional um, as exceeding the president's authority. Um, so as a result of this four to four split, we have a whole bunch of undocumented uh, family members of US citizens who are in a, a, a dodgy uh, deportation status and are, likely, and, and are possibly will be deported as a result. So given the uncertainty and given the fact that whoever appoints the next justice plus some others may significantly change the course of constitutional law, here are some areas where there might be some changes or as an homage to David Bowie, ch ch ch, -ch changes. Um, there could be some changes in the way the abortion cases are handled. It's not likely that Roe would be overturned, but there are some things on the horizon, and there's a recent case that could affect the outcome. I think affirmative action possibly could be affected, although with Justice Kennedy, I think he signaled that it's not likely that there will be major changes. I think the death penalty is a possibility, um, given especially Justice Breyer and others' receptivity to new claims about it. Election law in the broadest sense, voter ID cases, restrictions on voting, etc. Those are possible areas of change. Clearly executive power, question of um, Second Amendment rights, and then in areas of religion, particularly free exercise and establishment clause. Those are all areas where one vote could easily change the outcome. Two votes most definitely will. Three votes probably secures a particular line of precedent for an entire generation. So in those seven areas, very, very, a lot at stake in this area. Now, what was Justice Scalia's effect on the court while he was there? Well, one thing you can say is that um, he established this kind of intellectual foundation for what's called originalism which is that you, the only proper way to interpret the Constitution is what it meant when it was written. Not necessarily what people intended it to mean, but what it meant. And before Justice Scalia, there was a kind of loose collection of arguments and people advocating for it. He really became the intellectual foundation for it. And even though he didn't write a lot of majority opinions in major cases, he really did establish this notion of originalism as a crucial piece in constitutional adjudication. 
He also was really good friends with Justice Ginsburg, which many people find unusual because they're so different. Um, but she gave some advice yesterday in her piece when she said, at home and at work, it pays to be a little deaf. <laughs> and so they got along famously. They used to vacation together. This is a picture from a vacation they took together in India where they're riding the elephant. I'll tell you what's significant here. He's waving with his right hand. <laughs> and look which hand she's using. Yeah, for those of you who are listening to NPR this morning, you probably heard that she, uh, they, they disagreed on originalism specifically. Um, uh, I think the, the, the snippet of the interview with Nina Totenberg I heard this morning had her taking the position that uh, when the Constitution was drafted, it, it didn't include a whole bunch of people who are now part of the, of the politic of the United States. Um, John and I, as con law professors, would go back a little earlier than that and say that, that John Marshall, one of the most authoritative early Supreme, uh, Supreme Court justices, he was the chief justice uh, early in the court, uh, said it very well in some very foundational cases that the Constitution is written in very broad bro brushstrokes um, and is, is drafted to adapt, uh, which kind of flies in the face of Justice Scalia's position. Yeah, Marshall's position was the Constitution is meant to work. It's meant to last for the ages, and it's meant to work. And the framers being practical men, drafted a document that could be flexible. Not that the principles change, but their application in new circumstances change. So Marshall very early on said, if we have a choice between interpreting the Constitution in a way that would undermine its effectiveness, or interpreting it in a way that would enhance its effectiveness as a national government, we ought to choose the latter. And so I think Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer fall into that category. Um, one last point, and then we can talk about the decisions. This is still Justice Kennedy's court, and it becomes clear in the affirmative action decision from last semester. Um, it's going to be less likely to be his court if there's a President Clinton. It becomes more likely to remain his court if there's a President Trump. So what are the big decisions? Terry, what are the big decisions? Well, uh, I'm going to give you the, the one big decision that uh, we talked about last year. For those of you who came to our presentation on, on last year, Fisher versus uh, the, United, the University of Texas was on the horizon as the big case from the last term. Um, for those of you who have been, uh, not been following what happened in this case, the Supreme Court did indeed uphold on a four to three vote the race conscious undergraduate program used uh, as part of the admissions process for the University of Texas. Uh, Texas is a 10% um, plan state. They, the top 10% of a graduating class from high school um, is the first to be admitted. And then there's a discretionary program at the University of Texas for other folks. And race is one of the factors that was considered in that program. Uh, this, uh, this program was upheld by the United States Supreme Court. All right, why four to three? Uh, only seven justices. I thought there were nine. Even without Scalia, there's eight. Um, Elena Kagan, who uh, was the Solicitor General of the United States, recused on this case. She was uh, working for the government at the time and initially came up and the government had taken a, the US government had taken a position on the case so she recused and of course Justice Scalia passed away in the meantime giving us a 4-3 decision um, upholding the University of Texas's program had Scalia been on, been on the court this would have been a 4-4 vote and would have left the lower courts decision in place um, which would have not changed the outcome here the Fifth Circuit had already upheld the University of Texas's program under the standard that the court set in Fisher 1 uh, finding it they did have a narrowly tailored program that met the strict scrutiny standard for race conscious programs. So the University of Texas would have been free to use its, uh, its race conscious program. Uh, the nice thing about having a 4-3 decision is now it's the law of the land. Um, and every public university can feel free to set up a race conscious program that is consistent with what the court, what, what the court upheld for the University of Texas. The other big decision involved abortion restrictions. Um, many states are passing what are called trap laws, targeted restriction on abortion provider laws. Um, Texas had a number of them, including requiring doctors have admission privileges and certain building requirements for the clinics themselves. And this case did depend on Justice Scalia's um, absence because the court, with Justice Kennedy, said when laws are passed that restrict abortion 
providers on the basis of protecting women's health, there has to be some actual benefit to women's health. You can't just accept the state's say so that these restrictions advance women's health. And in this case, the court looked closely at the facts. For example, how many women would have to travel long distances in Texas to get an abortion if these laws went into effect? How difficult would it be? And the court concluded there has to be a realistic connection between women's health as a restriction on abortion and actually advancing women's health. That's a big change because with Justice Scalia it's likely that the court would have said as long as the state has some sort of rational basis to advance women's health, even if people could disagree, that would be okay. This is an area where future justices will have an opportunity to write on effectively a blank slate. And it's why I said future justices aren't likely to undo Roe versus Wade, but depending on how they understand what a realistic look or realistic connection between the state's purpose and the law means could make a big difference between whether or not these trap laws remain in place. If this case is sustained ongoing, most of the current wave of trap laws are probably, if not unconstitutional, on weak constitutional grounds. So that's an area worth watching, uh, especially given who gets to appoint the Supreme Court. But that was it for last term. Um, without Justice Scalia, the court got very, very cautious. There was one case everybody expected to be a blockbuster involving religious accommodations for uh, the Obamacare health care law, the Little Sisters of the Poor, and the court said, hey, you guys go figure out some other ways to accomplish this, and completely punted on the decision, clearly indicating that they weren't anywhere near agreement. Other than that, there weren't a lot of big cases. What's coming up? Well, a, a huge area um, that's, got the, uh, that's coming up this next term is race in the criminal justice system, or more importantly, uh, the extent to which the court is going to permit racial stereotypes to be used in making decisions in the criminal justice system. Uh, these t cases are incredibly important. Um, the first one is Pena Rodriguez versus Colorado, a case out of the Colorado Supreme Court, um, in which uh, after a conviction by a defendant for unlawful sexual contact and harassment under state law, uh, two jurors came forward to his lawyer and told him that one of the jurors exhibited racial bias against the defendant during jury deliberations. In particular, he said, during jury deliberations, the quote up there, I think he did it because he is Mexican and Mexican men take whatever they want. That was, that's just the tip of the iceberg of the things he said during deliberations. He also said during deliberations that the defendant's alibi witnesses lacked credibility because among other things, one of them was an illegal. Um, apparently, uh, and I don't know if the witness actually was or not, but apparently uh, finding that people who are undocumented were inherently un not credible. Um, both exhibiting uh, bias, uh, in this case, against Mexican-Americans. Um, this case juxtaposes a rule of evidence that does not permit testimony about jury deliberations in court against the Sixth Amendment right to an impartial jury. Um, basically, jury deliberations are considered to be private. Uh, we want jurors to be able to discuss the implication, the uh, evidence and what their outcome is going to be in private without it being subject to court, um, to review in some sort of court setting where their deliberations become evidence to attack the verdict. Uh, so we have this evidence rule, it's rule 606B in Colorado, juxtaposed against the Sixth Amendment right to an impartial jury. Uh, the court in Colorado held that the right, the, the deliberation, the secrecy of jury deliberations um, actually trumped the Sixth Amendment right to an impartial jury. Uh, interestingly, and, and of course the Supreme Court uh, granted cert to decide which one wins. Uh, does this, it, this value we have in making sure jury deliberations are kept sacrosanct versus uh, a right to an impartial jury that isn't uh, infected with some sort of racial or ethnic bias. Just as an aside, um, four Colorado Supreme Court justices dissented in this case, including Justice Allison E who is on Trump's shortlist um, for potential Supreme Court nominees, interestingly enough. So we have one here who at least voted 
with the dissenters who would have held that there's an exception to the rule of evidence in cases um, under the Sixth Amendment where there's allegations of racial or ethnic bias. The other case, also really important um, for, the, for how racial stereotypes will play out in criminal cases, is Buck versus Davis. In this case, Buck um, uh, was convicted of murder, and during the penalty phase of his case, where the prosecutors were uh, seeking the death penalty, uh, his own lawyer put on an expert witness who testified, and I'm going to quote here, um, that it's a sad commentary that minorities, Hispanics and black people, are overrepresented in the, in the criminal justice system. During his testimony about what factors should be considered in deciding future dangerousness, a factor that's considered in, in determining whether the death penalty should be imposed on a criminal defendant. He also responded to a question by the prosecution as to whether race, and in particular being black, increases future dangerousness, and responded, yes. It does, um, obviously relying on, on all kinds of racial stereotypes about the uh, behavior of African-American males. Buck was sentenced to death by the court in Texas, and his sentence was upheld on appeal. He filed an initial habeas corpus petition and did not include ineffective assistance of counsel, which putting on a witness like this who's going to testify against your client seems like a possibility. Um, he, he did not put that uh, in his initial habeas petition. However, three years after that petition, the um, actual, the state of Texas uh, admitted in another case that it, it had improperly used this witness um, and his testimony about future dangerousness based on race, uh, that that was not a proper thing to use in trying to decide uh, that future dangerousness and imposing the criminal, and, and imposing the death penalty. As you might expect, uh, his lawyer, his current lawyer said, okay, there's an open door for this, we're gonna file another habeas petition. The problem is, he didn't raise this issue on direct appeal or in his initial petition. Um, he filed a, another federal habeas petition also, which was thrown out because he, didn't, he failed to raise the ineffective assistance counsel argument. Uh, and now um, he is he, he made a request for a certificate of appealability, which is sort of an exception to this rule, um, which was denied by the Fifth Circuit. Uh, that is what is on appeal to the United States Supreme Court, uh, in particular uh, whether the Fifth Circuit is using too high a standard for a certificate of appealability in the context where the defendant's own witnesses uh, made racially biased statements in, in uh, the penalty phase of his uh, uh, of his criminal case. What's interesting is that one of the prosecutors in this case has actually written uh, an op-ed saying this is the sort of case where you can make an exception. Sometimes justice demands an exception and there ought to be an exception here to whatever rule would prevent this from being heard. So other prosecutors have also weighed in saying sometimes racial justice has to be the primary um, component of a decision. So it'll be interesting to see where the court goes with this. And they've kept it on their, on their docket, so mm -hmm. you know, chances are they probably do have five votes for some position here. Keeping the same thing, uh, theme of race, uh, in this case, race and redistricting, um, these, this, these are two cases, McCrory versus Harris and Bethune Hill versus Virginia, um, that resulted from redistricting after the 2010 census. In McCrory, um, it was North Carolina is redistricting for the US House of Representatives. In the Bethune Hill case, it was about Virginia's redistricting for the Virginia legislature, so setting the boundaries of who's going to represent who in the state legislature in that case. Um, in McCrory, uh, the court held that the state's redistricting, which created two majority minority districts, in this case majority black districts, violated the Equal Protection Clause because race played a predominant factor um, in how those districts were, were uh, set up, and there was no compelling state interest that, and narrow tailoring um, that was satisfied, the, the strict scrutiny standard, which would need to be satisfied to, to use race in that way. Compare and contrast to Bethune Hill. Uh, where the court held that um, uh, the creation of 12 majority-minority
minority districts by the state of Virginia did um, not violate the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, the court held that 11 of the 12, in, in a, the creation of 11 of the 12 districts, race was not a predominant factor in how the district lines were formed, even though it did create a, um, a majority minority districts. In the one district where it did play a, a predominant role, the court held that the state had a compelling interest um, and used narrowly tailored means uh, to achieve those interests. Both of these cases involved the Voting Rights Act in part, and in fact, part of the way that Virginia justified what it did was saying we were complying with the Voting Rights Act by creating these majority minority districts. Um, so these are two interesting cases that came out in the opposite direction, one upholding the plan, one striking the plan of the Equal Protection Clause. And the court's going to have an opportunity to decide when do, what facts support, when does race predominate in how districts are formed, um, and what would serve to meet the strict scrutiny standard should race be a predominant factor. Upcoming case, this term involves the Establishment Clause, and it's a pretty sort of weird fact pattern, but nonetheless could have significant impact. Real quickly, Missouri has this recycling grant program where they recycle tires and they offer schools the opportunity for these tires to be used in playgrounds as the, you know, I guess you would call it when kids fall problem. And so a religious school asked for these recycled tires and in Missouri they have a provision in their constitution that, that prevents any state money from being spent on religion. And so the Missouri court said, well, that means we can't give you any of this money under the grant program. And of course, the court, the school appeals saying, well, that, in, that violates our free exercise rights. There had been an other case about 10, 12 years ago involving a scholarship program in the state of Washington that the state of Washington's constitution said you can't give money to religion, therefore they wouldn't give scholarships to people studying for religious degrees. And the court upheld that saying, well, states are free to make this sort of judgment about which is more important, the Establishment Clause or the Free Exercise Clause. So, this being on the docket suggests that somebody on the court, maybe four people, are interested in revisiting that notion from that scholarship case. So even though it doesn't sound like a huge matter, tires for recycling, depending on how the court comes out, it could undermine or limit the state's ability under their own constitution to regulate the church-state barrier in the way that they've been able to up to now. Trademark infringement case. This one is just granted on Friday, um, and it involves a attempt by a group called the Slants to trademark their name. It was a musical group, and the trademark office turned it down, saying, "Well, that's a disparaging. That disparages Asians." And so the issue is whether or not that's a legitimate reason for the trademark office to deny a trademark. Now, the outcome of this case will effectively decide the case that's moving through the court system involving the question of the Washington Redskins. The court just this morning refused to hear an expedited appeal of the Washington case. So I don't think it makes any difference for the outcome of that case. What happens in Lee versus Tam will determine whether or not the Washington case is decided one way or the other. So what are the maybe cases for this term? Because the court hasn't accepted very many cases, a sign that they are being very cautious to only take cases that they have seem to be able to reach some agreement. And we've identified three general areas where we see, depending on the outcome of the election and how soon somebody gets appointed, future um, cases may fall into some of these categories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's several voter ID cases that are pending out there. Of course, uh, you know, these are cases where uh, states have required voter IDs, um, and of course the argument is that has uh, impacts on uh, minority communities as well as lower socioeconomic status communities. Um, we'll see if they grant cert in some of those cases that are playing out there. Do you want to do transgendered issues, or I can? 
Go ahead. Okay. So uh, we do have a, a case out of Virginia um, where a school refused to allow a transgendered boy to use uh, the, the boy's restroom. Um, so uh, these are cases that are pending, um, positions that are pending before the Supreme Court. We don't know if they're going to grant certain them or not, but potentially could. Um, and and you should expect even more cases involving transgender issues since mm -hmm. states have passed a number of fairly restrictive limitations and so absent any guidance by the Supreme Court, I think people will continue to file lawsuits challenging these laws and mm -hmm. again, depending on what the court says in the future, may put a, a stop to those laws or may encourage more of them. Mm -hmm. And the last case involves a baker um, who refused right. to make a cake for a same-sex wedding. Um, there's many public accommodations laws that prohibit discrimination um, on various statuses, including sexual orientation. So uh, that case is out there as well as one that potentially um, may make its way, it, well, it's actually may make its way to the Supreme Court, depending on, I think, again, it'll depend on who the justices are who are appointed. And these cases are limited in the in sense of the sorts of facts that would give rise to them. So for example, the Baker case. These cases can only arise in states that have state public accommodation statutes that prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation. So there's no federal law that has the similar effect. So only in states where there's a public accommodation law and only in states where that public accommodation law protects against discrimination based on sexual orientation are you ever likely to have a baker, photographer, wedding venue case arising. Now, in Arkansas, there is a public accommodations law, but it doesn't apply to sexual orientation. So a case like this couldn't arise here. Mm -hmm. And just to make it clear, they're uh, coming up against free exercise claims by our bakers uh, who don't religiously agree with that position. Right. Mm -hmm. So as you see, the court has been very careful to take cases. And so far, it's not a terribly exciting term from court watchers. There are some really crucial cases. Um, the race and the criminal justice cases are the exception to this rule that things are not really percolating at the court. Um, let me just end before we start questions with a comment somebody made about the upcoming court, or at least the term, and they said, instead of culture wars and political jousting, there will be cases involving cheerleader uniforms, patents for incontinence products, banks behaving badly, and a golden doodle named Wonder. So that's what we have to look forward to in the upcoming term. So we'll be happy to take your questions now for as long as we've got. First of all, let's thank them. What a, what a great presentation. Great service outlining uh, what the court has done, will do, and may do. And may do. And may do. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Yes, Fiona. Right behind you, Bob. Bob, behind you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Fiona Sloan, and as you know, I'm a student here at the Clinton School. Um, my question is about Merrick Garland. If he is not confirmed and the Senate doesn't act to do anything on that issue, what's going to happen after the presidential election? I know you mentioned some candidates that Clinton is vetting. Is there any chance that rolls over, or sort of what, what happens to, to poor Merrick Garland? <laughs> Well, strictly speaking, the, the nomination won't roll over to the next term. And so there's a, there's a clock ticking and, and the bell goes off at the end of the term. So if Merrick Garland is to make it on the Supreme Court, it depends on the next president renominating him and then the next Senate confirming him. I will say there's not a whole lot of pundits who are uh, opining that a President Clinton would, would renominate right. him. They seem to think she'd, do, she'd go a little more interesting than, but he's, he was chosen, I think, to be just a really palatable candidate to Republicans in a lot of ways. And there's some sort of long range, almost a conspiracy theory that says, well, you know, if Clinton wins the election in November, Republicans are facing Merrick Garland or an unknown quantity of justices who may even be more liberal. And for a while, there was some thinking that that may cause the Senate Republicans to decide to move on his nomination. It's hard to see how that would actually happen. 
uh, although there's a certain logic to it, but most people think that's unlikely completely. Yes, ma'am, you have a question right here. here. Because I just read this morning that there was some notion that the Senate, that with the polls changing, that some of the Republicans might be willing to confirm, to avoid. Just, you answered my question. And, and I think, here's what I would say. It also depends on the political realities. So, for example, in the unlikely event that the Senate shifts hands and there's a really large Democratic majority where it seems possible that a President Clinton could get through whomever she nominated, I think then the chances that the current Senate might move on Merrick Garland are more likely because he clearly would be more palatable. If, however, the Senate stays in Republican hands or even a Democratic Senate with a small majority, there's really no incentive, political incentive, for the Republicans to do anything this fall. Yes, sir, you have a question over here? The, okay, I thought you had Okay, who else? Somebody had their hand up? Any other questions? Yeah, right here, up, right wait, up here. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Alan, here comes the microphone. Alan Gates, and I wanted to ask you about ask you too about the free exercise clause out of uh, case out of Missouri. Um, I think that case was granted before Scalia's death, and it has dragged along in terms of getting scheduled. And I wondered if you had any commentary about the idea that maybe there's some buyer's remorse there. Um, that's a good way to put it. The last meeting where the court granted cert was in January. All the cases they granted cert on in that, that conference have been scheduled for argument or decided except that one. So there is some sense that, that they're struggling with it. Um, again, the likelihood is that they don't have any, anything even close to four votes in any one position. So they may be waiting and waiting and waiting to see what happens. Yeah, I mean, this case is, that case is an interesting one because it really does sort of uh, going to develop the line of what a state, you know, can do thinking it doesn't want to violate the Establishment Clause, it wants to make sure it doesn't get engaged in religion, and yet ha have the Free Exercise Clause have meaning. So, you know, we certainly know that um, a, a city can have police directing traffic when church gets out. That's perfectly fine. It doesn't, doesn't go too far. But uh, how much a and we know that giving books to a, a parochial school or a religious school is going too far, but where is that in between? Um, and is it a playground? I don't know. And this is an area where Justice Scalia played a particularly large role, um, both writing opinions but also influencing outcomes. And he had very strong views about that. He was very clearly what might be called an accommodationist, where he saw lots of room for the state to accommodate religion. And um, one of his best, whatever you think of Justice Scalia, he was a wonderful writer, and he gave you your money's worth when you read his opinions. And in one free exercise case, he talked about an old precedent, and he said, this is like a ghoul from a late night movie. And the court drags it out to scare children off the streets, only to put it back in its cage when it's no longer needed. So he clearly had some views there. And it seems to me that a future court really has to deal with some potentially um, dynamic cases. So. Just in the last few years, the court allowed city councils to open their meetings with prayer and left open the limits on that. You know, could any city council do it even if they've never done it before? Did it only apply to cases in which the city council had a history of doing it? Did it apply to cases where the prayer was non-denominational? Did it apply to cases where the city council was giving the prayer as opposed to a member of the audience? And you see, each of those is a different twist on this boundary between church and state. And given a different justice in Justice Scalia's place, I think you could have an outcome that says, no, you can't do it just because you thought it was a good idea this year. No, you can't have the city council members deliver the prayer. No, you can't have it be a sectarian prayer. Um, a Justice Scalia clone would answer each of those, I think, in the opposite direction. Yes. Fran, do you have a question right here? When, when does the current court look at the possibility of adding additional cases to its docket, and does that depend on when and if another justice is affirmed? 
So they're constantly looking at whether to uh, grant certain other cases uh, in additional cases. And they, they have a lot to go. They have a lot of room uh, in their docket to add cases this term. Um, I think that's the, you know, your second part of your question is sort of the big question. Are they waiting to see if somebody gets appointed? Um, I mean, I think there's a good possibility they are at least not taking controversial cases or, or granting cert yet until they see whether somebody ends up being appointed um, because they will not come to a 5-4 decision. And if you think about, or at least a majority decision, um, given the split in the court right now, and if you think about their constitutional role, they're out there to settle disputes. And so coming to 4-4 decisions right. is not helpful. Um, it just leaves the lower court position in place and doesn't establish any national uniform role. I mean, one of, the, one of the key parts of their job is to establish uniformity in the interpretation of the Constitution. And they're not doing it with 4-4 votes. Yeah. And officially, although these aren't, aren't rules that can't be broken, but officially they meet once a month to decide which new cases to take. So imagine they're building up a backlog. Over the course of this year, they will get about seven to 8,000 cert petitions. So they have to start taking some of them at some point. But what's clear is they're being very, very cautious in only taking cases that, as Terry said, probably would result in, an, in a decision one way or the other. They can't do that forever. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Madeline Chesson. I'm also a Clinton School student. My question is kind of formulating from this idea that right now the Supreme Court is unable to make any sort of decision, quote unquote, on controversial topics because it's a 4-4 decision. Um, so given that, on what grounds is the Senate able to stay the decision legally? And kind of how is that working? Forgive my ignorance on legal system. Well, there's. There's a legal doctrine called the political question doctrine. It says when the Constitution gives responsibility to another branch of government, courts won't touch it. And so the Constitution says the president shall nominate with the advice and consent of the Senate, or the president shall appoint with the advice and consent of the Senate. So the Senate can choose when it gives advice and how it gives its consent. And so there's nothing legally that forces them to do anything. The the political pressure that might be brought to bear for them to do something one or the other is really the only remedy under the Constitution. There's no court that could, that could force the Senate to act. Yes, ma'am, right here. She's coming with the microphone. Won't the fact that the Senate has to confirm in 60 votes to moderate to some extent each, either side? Yeah, I mean, and that, that's sort of been, and I think that goes back to the calculation about Merrick Garland, for example. Um, again, if the, if the Republicans have a control of the Senate or even a slight minority, they can still effectively block an appointment. Now, there is a difference there. There had been a compromise about 10 years ago. Um, our former Senator Mark Pryor was part of that group that said Senate, the Senate could filibuster lower court nominees, but not Supreme Court justices. So if they still follow that compromise, then even a slight majority could carry the day. Again, it's hard to, hard to know because they don't have to follow their agreements. They can change them as they go. Oh, yes, sir, got a question right over here. There's a microphone behind you. Oh no, you can't let him ask a question. <laughs> Well, with regard to the uh, filibuster possibilities, uh, if the Democrats had even the smallest majority in the Senate, since they recently changed and did away with the filibuster on the lower courts, is there much reason to think that uh, they said they weren't doing it with regard to the Supreme Court, but that was an easy decision because there wasn't a vacancy that could then Right. turn around and change the rule with regard to the Supreme Court's by majority vote. At least that's what they did with the lower courts, correct? Yes, that's right. So, but that goes to the, again, to the constitutional rule that the Senate can make its own rules. And so they could decide to create the filibuster rule for Supreme Court justices or undo it. Um, but even a slight majority, even if, for example, the the agreement holds that a majority vote 
would be sufficient for a Supreme Court justice. Remember, not all Democrats and not all Republicans are equally ideological. And so it's quite possible that a slight majority one way or the other, um, you would have members of the, of the other party joining with the other side. So even having a majority, say, Democrats in the Senate doesn't guarantee a Clinton appointee would be, would be affirmed. Well, thank you very much. This was great. Uh, Dean Biner, Dean Pippa, this is your second time back on the first Monday in October, so we'll look forward to first Monday in October 2017. But in the meantime, um, I just thank you for the public service you're providing and this educational opportunity and letting people know about and Skip, it. And Skip, let me thank you for the cooperation we have between the law school and the Clinton School. We've got our JD MPS, but we also do programs like this, and it's wonderful to have two institutions so close together, working together on matters of common interest. So thank you, Skip. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give